Figo, along with J4 and Mr. Fresh. Okay. And we want to introduce the special guest today. He's written songs that have broken your heart. He's from the band Formerly of Mint Condition. He is the host of the nineties R&B alumni. Please let us introduce one and only Carrie Lewis. All right. And how you guys doing? Special guest today. Doing great. Thank you. Songs. Good to be with you guys. Right. So thank you again, Mr. Kerry Lewis, for joining us here. Um, just to let you know that we are the Jimmy Gal Materials Facebook group, over 6,500 members. And guess what? They wanted to reach out to you and you responded. So thank you. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Right. Okay. So first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, man. Just, you know. Good. Enjoying the weekend, trying to get back to a little bit of music and, you know, Dope. kind of relax, take it easy a little bit. Yeah, okay. sounds like a plan. Yeah. Right. And of course, um, I know the tough times of this pandemic, you know, I'm sure you want to get those creative juices flowing and get the music out there. So what's been happening with you in that regard? Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, if there was any good thing about the pandemic, um, just that that pause for a minute and just you know coming back to some creativity and you know when when tragic things like that happen sometimes that brings things out of you and like I said just pausing and taking a minute and just you know stepping back from everything and kind of looking at the world that definitely um I think it kind of born like some creativity out of me so I'm at the point now where I'm really getting ready to start sharing a lot of that music with other people and start doing collaborations and everything. Cause I haven't really put out too much music uh, recently, but I'm ready to get back to that. I'm excited. Oh, that's great. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you was um, off topic apart from, from the music, but we saw in the news recently, the verdict with the George Floyd murder and also yep. the impact it had across not just America, across the world and on Black lives. Um, what, what do you say to, to seeing that? Would you say that justice was served or is there still um, a long road to go? No, I, I have a hard time calling it justice. You know, George Floyd didn't get justice. But I would say, you know, there was accountability for once. Right. Um, that doesn't happen too often, if at all. So I was glad to see that happen, but you know, I don't know if I would call it justice. And that whole situation is really, you know, a trip for me because I, I grew up in South Minneapolis, really five blocks from where that happened. And uh, you know, just the other day as a trial was going on and they were showing uh, dash cam footage of cars driving through the neighborhood. It's just like, wow, you know, yeah, some things crazy. have changed, some things haven't changed at all. Right. So, right. but let's, let's hope that uh, some things will change from that verdict. Well, we really Absolutely. hope so too, right? I hope this is a step in block to, to, to things to be better for the inequality and the um, bias in the, in the justice system, especially yeah. with the uh, minorities. And um, yeah. you know, as I said, it does, doesn't just affect everyone in America, but across the world, even in the Caribbean as well. You know, mm -hmm. these things are happening. Uh, we yeah. want to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. So yeah. thank you so much. Definitely. Yeah, appreciate that. Well, as you know, right. um, we always have questions from our fans, from the members of the Facebook group. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, we're going to dish out a few rounds of questions at you. So okay. let's hope you got your boxing gloves and you're ready to go. <laughs> let's do it. Let's, let's do go. it. <laughs> So hey, I'll let Jay Force start it off, yeah? All right, okay, here we go. So we got a question for one of our active members, um, Tivian Reese Corey, and he's asking you, Kerry, when you released Love a few years back, were you planning to drop an album then? And it's a two-part question, by the way. And if mm -hmm. so, what happened? Are you also planning to do more production with other artists in the near future as well? So when I did the love, uh, I think that was 2016, somewhere around there. 
definitely a few years back. Um, I was kind of moving in that direction, but then ultimately, as I kept, you know, doing more songs, I kind of resulted in the fact that I wanted to hear other artists on the, on that material. And so again, I'm kind of moving back in the direction of producing that material for other artists. But um, so I, to answer part two, I definitely will be working with other artists in the very near future and probably producing a lot of that music that I was gonna do for myself, I'll probably end up producing that for somebody else. Okay. Now, I just really wanna give it, you know what I mean? As a songwriter, I wanna give those songs the best representation that I can give them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Sure, yeah. Wait a minute, you artists. Are you thinking about um, solo artists, um, do duos or groups? Um, Man, there's so many incredible artists out there that I would love to work with. You know, there's, of course, on the new genre of R&B. I love her. I love Lucky Day, yeah. uh, Snow Allegra, people like that. Um, but then going back, you know, back to the day, you know, like if Earth, Wind & Fire was doing another record, I would love to see Men Condition get involved with it, something like that. Or um, who else? That'd be perfect. It, just incredible yeah. people like that. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. right, right. Definitely. Wow. Yeah. Great. All right. All right. You, um, want to pick up that next, uh, you want to pick up that next question, Figo? Yeah, sure. No problem. All right. So this is from Andrew Nicola, if I'm saying this correctly. Uh, he said, being a keyboard like Jimmy Jam, what did you learn from your experience of flight time, especially when it comes to playing the keys and who were among the greatest influences and most, what were your most memorable sessions? Wow, that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, you know, I gotta say, even just aside from being a keyboard player, just walking through the doors of flight time, um, I, I felt like the learning started immediately because it was, it, it's hard for me to describe the feeling of, you know, going into a studio where people like Terry and Jimmy were working on Michael and Janet, a slew of other artists and people that you looked up to all this, all this time. But um, more specifically to the keyboard situation, uh, I think that was the first time that I really got to see the slew of keyboards that Jimmy Jam used. And he was yeah, right. definitely a, a keyboard junkie like myself and he had everything all the way down to this fair light that they use from time to time. And it, I think Stevie Wonder was the only other person that I knew that had used it. And um, he had mad over iron keyboards and just everything you could think of. So that was, that was like incredible to see and witness and some of the stuff that they had did, being able to see some of that up close in person was amazing. So I learned a lot just, just by being around those guys and being at the studio and working with them and, we all learned a lot. We all call it like the school of flight time, you know what I mean? Because that's really what it was for us. Right. Wow. Actually, Kerry, uh, it, it brings me back to maybe thinking that you growing up in Minneapolis, right? And you got Jimmy and Terry in Minneapolis, and you as you know, a young gentleman, young teenager, and you're actually hearing songs produced and written by Jimmy and Terry. Fast yep. forward years later, and you can't believe that you're in the actual studios of some exactly. of these songs that you've actually heard. What's your exactly. feeling like that? What was that feeling like? That, that's what I was kind of trying to say earlier. Like, I, I can't even just break it down to one thing, but just, you know what I mean? Like in the eighties, Terry and Jimmy, their sound really kind of set up so much for the nineties mm -hmm. with everything that they did for, you know, SOS band and, and yeah. getting started with Janet Jackson. Mm -hmm. like that went a long ways to setting everything up that was going to come in the next decade. So like you said, you know, fast forward years later and here we are in the studio working with them. It, it was just mind blowing. And, but like I said, every time I walked through the door, my mind was blown. So, <laughs> yeah. what, would say was great the, experience. what would you say was your most memorable session? My most memorable session, uh, it might have been on the very first record. You know, Flight Time was kind of divided into a number of different studios. Right. And, and we, we worked in a couple studios. 
Terry had his own studio, Jimmy had his own studio. And then there was one song that we did on the first album. I, I don't even remember the name of the song, but I remember recording part of it in Jimmy's studio, which Ooh, just nice. had a whole different energy. You know what I mean? Right, like we do right, right. most of the record here, but yeah. this particularly song, song he really liked and he you know we would start messing around with it and i always remember that to this day you know what i mean like that was right. another moment that just took it a little bit further like i'm actually in the studio you know working with somebody that i admired like that for so long right. in with keys and and songwriting and production like right it wow. doesn't get any better than that <laughs> definitely definitely Go ahead, Doug. <laughs> all right let me see if i can take the opportunity to tell this story and keep it as short as possible. Okay. May, 1990, Keyboard Magazine did a cover on Jimmy and Terry. Mm -hmm. So of course, seeing those guys on the cover, I snatched it up immediately, took it home, took it to the studio, sat down and read it. A little sidebar in there about some of the groups that they were thinking about producing. And one of the groups was Mint Condition. The other group mentioned in that article was King's English, which Spencer Bernard was a part of. Mm -hmm. In any event, it was a sidebar. It wasn't, it, it was a very small sidebar. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, so Jam and Lewis got a, a band finally coming to flight time. I got to check this out. Kept the magazine, no problem. About a year later, when Meant, Meant to Be Mint dropped, I was driving to work one morning and I was late. And I finally got to work. I got to the parking lot, but at that time, Donnie Simpson had his morning show on WKYS mm -hmm. here in DC. So I'm sitting there, man, I'm flustered, I'm late. Finally found a parking space in this crowded parking lot. I'm about to pull the key out of the car. Donnie puts on this track and I'm sitting there listening to this track. It's like in the midst of everything that was being released around that time, mm -hmm. I was like, who is this? And I sat down and listened to the entire track and as I'm listening to this track, I'm like, this joint is hot. I haven't heard anything like this on the radio. So I'm sitting there and finally he announces the name of the group. It was Men Condition. And immediately I said, those are the guys that Jimmy and Terry are signing. Yeah. And actually it was your first single. I think the first single was True to Thee, right? Uh, are You Free? Are You Free? One. It was Are You yeah. Free? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I don't have to hear the rest of this album. I <laughs> ran and got that joint that day. Yeah. And uh, it was funny because back in the day, it was a bunch of us that were really big fans of yours. And you remember uh, the, you remember the name of this young lady named um, Lisa Stanton. Oh, yeah. Definitely. We, we were good friends. And she tricked me into somehow sending my, my CD out to her, <laughs> made us some cock and mamie story. And it came back and all you guys autographed it. Okay. And I was like, nice. that, nice. that, is, that is dope. I but like when that. I heard when I heard Are You Free, I was like, this is what I've been waiting for. So I'm saying yeah. all of that to lead up to the question that you've heard a thousand times. Lee Aquarius Birch is asking, is there a possibility of a mint reunion? You know what? I, I really hope so. And I, I hate to answer it that way, but I, I, I just, understand. It's hard to give a definite but the incredible thing is, you know, Stokely's finally got a chance to release solo material. And what I'm so excited about that is if, if you know all of us in Mint, you just know that there's so much music that's in all of us that even the group Mint Condition that does everything can't contain all that we do so it's like yeah yeah i'm right. happy i'm so happy that he's finally got a chance to really just you know what i mean explore different things that you want to do musically and you don't have to be bound by what the other five or six members are are exactly. saying and exactly. and everybody should have the ability to do that at any point in their career now that being said i hope and pray that we come back together, I, even if it's for one more album, one more right. tour, you know, and whatever goes along with that, I feel like right. we owe it to the fans. I feel like we owe it mm -hmm. to musicians and the history of black music. I think like we should do it at some point and I hope it's sooner than later. But I, that I being said, I, I get, 
I get the situation, you know. So yeah. I hope it happens. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, you're speaking for um, tons and tons of people. I mean, anywhere I go, if, whether it's Stokely's woke with Stoke, or somebody mentions mint condition yep. somewhere, and there's a possibility for people to leave comments, the comments are off the chart, man. It's yeah. it's yeah. like, and True. again, being you were talking about this before we came all on being a musician and a producer. There's two terms that I associate with mint condition that I use often, and the guys can tell you when I post in the group, I do this a lot too. The first term is uh, the name of one of your albums, definition of a band. Mm. But the second term is this, and I've experienced no other black band like this in my lifetime, is simply gumbo. Yeah, yeah. oh, gumbo. Yeah. Yeah. Got, yeah, it's a hell of a track, man. Yeah. Together so many genres in mint, it's like, my head is like, great job. Yeah. I'm his stuff, man. I'm going to tell you, you know, after years of, of just touring the country and going to radio stations, that word really summed up the best way to describe how we put everything in the pot for, exactly. you know, making records and doing music. Exactly. Nothing was excluded. Nothing was, you know, it was just like, let's put it all in the pot. Yeah. And then real quick, and, before we go on to the next some. question, I okay. wanted to make sure in that, <laughs> In being discovered, from what I understand, the great Jelly Bean Johnson discovered mm -hmm. you guys in a club in Minneapolis, bought you the flight time. Yep. What I remember, he was the producer of the album. J Jimmy and Terry were executive producers. Yep. But I had posted some weeks ago one of my favorite tracks, and it's really hard, but I'm going to say this. I'm going to say why it's one of my favorites is on the debut, I wonder if she likes me. Oh yeah, <laughs> man! Yeah. Oh, and, and he's uh yeah. he's playing a guitar solo. He's playing a guitar right? solo yeah. on that. You know, yeah. Jelly Bean is straight up rock, man. And Let me tell you, Bean man. is a beast. He's a Jelly beast, Bean man. Was a beast, and I I always had appreciation for him even prior to that, um, because I you could just kind of tell when people have their their lane and their contribution to what's right. going on in the whole project. Right. And like what he did with Janet Jackson with Black Cat, like oh, yeah, that, that song was well, amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And um, no. so and speaking of him, when we got to Flight Time, you know, him being, you know, the co-producer along with us, he really kind of showed us the ropes of like, OK, this is this is how you do it here. Like yeah. <laughs> we were doing songs on four track demos and whatever. <laughs> You know what I mean? But when right. we got the flight time, like Jelly Bean was the person that really was like, this is how you do two inch tape. This okay. is how you edit. This right. is how you do all this. And, oh, and a just a lot of uh, tips in production. And you could just tell that, you know, he has spent a lot of time with Terry and Jimmy. Right. And I'm, I'm always appreciative. You know, it was really him along with a, a good friend of his who was our first manager, James Popeye Greer. Popeye Greer. Uh, yeah, yeah, you guys Popeye. remember him from, uh, you know, don't be throwing chicken on my ride. <laughs> yeah. you know, Janet Jackson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you exactly. know, they were really close and, and they were really responsible for, you know, they, they saw us first and they got Terry and Jimmy to come out to First Avenue and see us and Dope. it all went down from there. So sweet, madly sweet. appreciative to both of those brothers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. What was it like cool. being um, playing in the iconic First Avenue? What was that like for you guys before? Being Man, there? that that place is iconic. I and you know even prior to Prince and Purple Rain, uh, like my brother had opened up with a group for like the Daz Band or something like that. And I remember riding my bike downtown just to try to see if I could get in and, and see. You know, I was mad young. I was definitely too young to get in First Avenue and all that. But it just, it's a place that has so much history in that city. And then by the time Purple Rain came along, of course, you know what I mean? It made it infamous. But um, coincidentally, that would be the place that we did our show that Terry and Jimmy came to. And when they saw that show, they were like, that's it. That's the band. That's the band we want. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's it's a magical place, though. I, I would imagine if we were to ever do a show in there again, just <laughs> stepping on that stage, you you would feel the history of what's happened in there before. Right, right. Nice. Sure, before, nice. You go, before you go any further, guys, no, there's a song on the Meant to be Mint, uh, from the Mint Factory, sorry. 
And when I first heard this song, I don't, it wasn't, a, it was an album cut. It wasn't released as a single. But the first thing that really hit me in this song, I'll mention the song in a minute. I heard the steel pans. Yeah. Strong. Yeah. I said, yeah. what? Man. Yeah. Give the story behind that there, Kerry. What's the harmony in it? I'm going to tell you, I'm not the best one to give the story. Yeah. Because it was really Odell and Stokely that, you know, they just incredible with the steel drums. Wow. And I didn't know that. Yeah, and I, I didn't know um, that Odell played steel drums. Okay. Yeah, he he played too, and I it, it might even be been part of a, a program at school or okay. or something that you know one of the teachers, you know, uh, had a class or something like that. But I that's why I say they would be able to tell a little bit better than me. But just incorporating that sound in in our music, like, is another example of how like that's we gumbo. just put everything in there. <laughs> and it, it's hilarious. Like I, I hear like a, a hip hop record, you know, 15 years later with still drums in that. I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> no, I, I have I like to say, that, you know, but, I have uh, to say, like for us, like Jay for myself, being from from the Caribbean. So when we hear steel pans, it's usually um, locked on to calypso, yep. soca, reggae. So when we heard like your you guys and Prince, we, he did it with the Under the Cherry Moon album. Yeah, you know, that, that like pulled us in because we were like, yeah. wow, steel pans yeah. used in the R&B, you know, the yeah. pop era. So I, I, well, I, 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 I forgot that he guys. did that, too. And yeah. when you said Under the Cherry Moon, like, I heard it. I heard yeah. the song. It was yeah, like, yeah. You know position. Like, I, that was a song. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, J4. You got the next one, bud. Uh, I think the other one is uh, by, well, part two by Leah Curtis Birch. And yep. he's asking, what, Kerry, is your favorite album of Mint Condition and why? You know what? I'm, I'm going to have to go with a definition of a band. Right. And let me, let me yeah. tell you why, though. Like, first Let's of hear. all, just, just down to the title. Ah. Like, yeah. like, this was the first time. Our first album was cool. Yeah, but I, I don't can it's hard to even consider it the first out because half of those songs were on our demo tape. Right. So it's like oh, we, we okay. took that and then redid them in the studio and then we added more songs to it. So that album is what it is. And it, it was cool. Right. And then from the Mint Factory, like that's when we were starting to to settle into what we were doing right. and starting to get recognition and people, you know, liking the singles and chart success and things like that. But the reason why I say definition of a band is because I felt like that was the first time that we crafted the album. Yeah. Like, it's one thing to go in the studio and do songs, but as a group of seven people, we went in the studio and made a record. And by this point, we were like, live band, live band, live band, yeah. Yeah. live yeah. band, live band, yeah. live band. Yeah. And that's right. all we right. were right. saying. So by the time we got to the record, it's like, we got to put that on the record too. Yeah. Right. So right. that that takes it even a step further. It's not even just, you know, at some point there there are groups out there and you might have a live sound and everything, but at that point we were doing everything. We were like we're a live band, we're going to sound like a live band on the record. We're going to craft an album that feels like it. It had musical interludes that were just from oh, everywhere man. you could think of. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I I I just that's why I say it's my favorite album because I think for musicians, like we fully represented what we were trying to do. There's no question on that about record. It. No question. No so, question. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. Um, All, right. All right. So the next question is from uh, Brian Williams, and he wants to know if you were working on any new music and with any particular artists. So. Um, when I was saying about like, you know, through the pandemic, definitely brought out some creativity and um, kind of gave me a, really a chance to sit down and get creative again and get back to songwriting and production and kind of just figure out what I really want things to sound like when it does come out. Um, so like I was saying, I'm, I'm to the point now where I'm, I'm getting ready to really start collaborating and sharing a lot of that music with other people and just, you know, try to get it out there because I don't I don't want to hold on to 
all these gems by myself. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, need, I just want to get back to sharing music with Sweet. the rest of the world and, you know, hopefully people like it. Yeah. But, nice. you know, to answer the question directly, definitely upcoming working with some artists and uh, we'll be producing and there'll be some stuff coming up. Sweet. And any um, future dates like that will be known? Say one more time. Any future dates of when it'll be released or? Uh, I'm not that close yet. So okay. We'll really be able to lock down the dates, but I'm going to be, you know, keeping people abreast and, and try right. to, you know, let people know and give them some previews of stuff that's coming really soon. Okay, that'd be great. Some good teasers. Nice. You know? yeah. 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 That'd be great. Nice. Yep. Nice. Okay. All right. All right, so I'll field this next question. This one is from Stiletto Lover Williams. And she's asking, beside keys, what other instruments do you play or would you like to play? You know, what? I, I really wish I was like one of those people that could just sit down with a piece of guitar and just play it <laughs> or, yeah. you know, play the hell out of it. But, yeah. I, I, you know, growing up, like in, in my household, we, we just had every instrument in the house basically in the basement drums guitar right. piano bass so we all play a little bit of everything and coincidentally okay. everybody in mint condition we all play every instrument as well so you know we had fun a lot of times there'd be rehearsals where nobody was playing the instrument that they originally played <laughs> <laughs> or we might do a rehearsal where we doing a song and then everybody get up and rotate and we keep it right moving, right right you know what i mean but that was some of the fun things you could do when, when people just play a lot of different instruments. So, so let me ask you a question, Kerry. Mm -hmm. How did you decide who was going to play what instrument? Like, was it like, okay. In the group? I'm, yeah. We kind of, uh, we kind of needed, you know, certain sounds. I, I tell people a lot of times like Rick playing bass guitar and me playing bass synth along with it mm -hmm. was kind of powerful. Like Ooh, and, and on the records too. Like you you'll hear bass guitar and bass synth. Right. And you know, right, looking back and you hear how, you know, the the intro on Pretty Brown Eyes just destroys radio. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> that, that's what Ooh, gave man, such yes. an impact. And Definitely. you know, that might have been something that led to that, you know what I mean? Combining those sounds and stuff. So I think as as a live group. You know, we were kind of formulating things and sometimes I would jump off and do other things, th things like strings and uh, pads or whatever, yeah. or horns. But, you know, for the most part, I did a lot of bass synth and doubling okay. that with the bass guitar. I think it gave us a real powerful sound. So. Yeah, between you um, playing bass synth mostly and you've got Larry on keys. Mm -hmm. um, Beast. And then Jeff, Jeff going back and forth between sax and keys. Yep. Like the Another core beat. progression before the breakdown of Pretty Brown Eyes, that chord progression is like, nobody else is doing this in r and I'm like, yeah. where did this even come from? And yeah. that's, that's another reason why I love Mint so much because there's no disrespect to any other bands, but I think part of it goes back to what you said before we went on board, every, before we came on rather, everybody knows that music education has slowly slipped out of the school system. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think that has a lot to do with it because it wasn't only Pretty Brown Eyes, but there are tons of songs that Mint did, not even the interludes, we won't even talk about those. But yeah, yeah, right. as, again, the chord progressions in some of those songs are not ice cream chord progressions. Yeah. You know, it was just amazing, man. It just blows me away every time. Yeah, I tell you, a lot of that was Lawrence. I mean, just incredible. And Jeff, yeah. you know, when yeah. it came to chord progressions, both of those dudes were just incredible. And, you know, Lawrence had a, a strong gospel background, oh, okay. but he also uh, just phenomenal appreciation for jazz. And yeah, I think I learned, nice. like my, I learned about jazz from my dad, but when I joined Mint Condition, I learned about jazz all over again from, from <laughs> Lawrence right, and right. Jeff and, yes. and Chris, Dave, and everybody else. Oh, so, man. Yeah, we yeah. can't forget Chris. Chris on those first yep. couple albums, man, everybody was yeah. like, you know, you see Mint and you say, okay, I see all these guys, but none of these guys that I'm seeing in the pictures, you know, we know it's Stokely plays drums, but he's not yep. the official drummer. So when I opened up Mint to be Mint and the following albums, I was like, 
Chris Daddy Davis on his joint. Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah. <laughs> so so we 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 uh, incorporated him in uh, after the first record, and it was just incredible. Like we Howard, we did a Black College tour on our first record. You know, like when right. Pretty Brown Eyes was out, and we toured all the Black colleges, and we went to Howard, and that's where we found Chris, and we we actually just plucked him right out of Howard. Right? Like, <laughs> he had to call his parents and be like, I'm done. You know what I mean? but, wow, I never knew that. That's interesting. No, okay. no that, that's how talented he is. And, yeah. you know, like we came across somebody incredible and just, you know, brought him into the fold because he had that much you. talent. Never Not knew that story. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Figo, I think you're up next. Yeah, uh, it's me again. Oh, okay, I thought it was J4. Uh, okay, well, we got one from um, Jessica Peterson Rogers, and she's asking, and this is a question that I've asked myself quite a few times. In recent years, the industry has leaned heavily into solo artists. Kerry, do you think that the music industry will welcome back bands in the future, and especially bands like yours, live bands? What's your take on that? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I'm gonna have to break it down like this. The industry, I don't know, because the industry is a mess. It's, <laughs> it imploded yeah. a few years back and nobody's able to make sense of two things at the same time since then. But as far as people and the fans um, and with the strength of independent record labels and, and, and different things like that, there's nothing stopping from 20 new bands coming out next year there's nothing stopping it you know what i mean because the industry isn't what it was before I, I don't even think the industry should hold weight to even decide whether that comes back or not i think That's people should just do it you know what i mean okay. i think if you get a collective of musicians out there put a band together and and do it you know do albums do everything and it's back in the day it it wasn't independent power like that so we kind of had to go the record company route right. now you don't really have to do that so I, I would like to see things born out of that you know what i mean like forget all the other stuff forget about the money and the politics and the economics of a band and all that you know what i mean because that that's how a record company looks at it Right. But if you ask me whether the industry and record companies <laughs> will bring it back, I doubt it. Yeah, I doubt no. it because everything comes down to economics at the end of the day. So, right. Yeah. You right. know. Okay. All right, um, Doug, you're up next. Or is it Figo? Figo, go ahead, Figo. Uh, well, it's one of Doug's questions. So uh, okay. this is going to take a bit. But, Kerry, we want to know um, the story of how Mint Condition came around, the original members. I heard that um, you guys got together from high school. Mm -hmm. So we all went to St. Paul Central with the exception of Ricky Kay, who's from Chicago. Right. Um, the only difference is we kind of were staggered a little bit. So I was the last one to graduate. And Jeff was a couple of years older than me. Stokes a couple of years older than him. So we were kind of there. Like when I was there, Stokely wasn't there. He already graduated, Odell and Lawrence. Oh, okay. But Jeff was there for a little while. So we all came <clears> through <throat> that, that school. They had a magnet program. They had a studio in the school. Um, that's where I met little Roger. We started doing music there. Um, a couple of other buddies that I went to school with there. We did a lot of incredible stuff. Like just to have a studio in the school was pretty amazing. Right. So I, I think that went a long ways and kind of help them in condition out, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice, okay. Go ahead, Doug, these are yours, go ahead. Go for it. All right, you answered a couple of uh, questions that I have on the list here already, Kerry, so I'm going to actually jump down to another question that I have further down the list since we covered them. It's pretty amazing. And uh, I'll keep it short. So You're a talented songwriter and musician. Went a long way. Not only with Mint, but on your solo project as discussed above. Beyond that, you, Lawrence, Stokely, and Jeff have written for other artists like Kelly Price. 
and you were the backup band for Tony Braxton at one point when she was on tour. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at your discog, if I look at Larry's discog, if I look at um, Jeff's discog, everybody else, you guys have touched a lot of different artists. Mm -hmm. I had discovered, um, we, know about, we all know about Kelly Price's track, but I had discovered an, uh, a group called Soul Tree. What was, like, what was it yeah. like working with them? Oh man, Sultry, they were mad talented. Uh, they had great harmonies too. And yeah. I, I wanna say that came from Gerald Busby. Um, you know, we, yeah. around our second project, that's when we started, like I said, started getting a little bit of recognition and people were kind of recognizing our sound. Yeah, and to the point where like record executives will wanna come and be like, oh, I, I want that mint sound for this artist or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, you dope. know, uh, Gerald, he brought Sultry through and um we got a chance to work on a few of their pro uh, a few of their records and that was a great experience like i said it was you know just to be recognized from other people too and you know they they kind of recognizing that you're formulating something you right. know what i mean like like when terry and jimmy came up they had a certain sound and teddy riley came up he had a sound and people sought that out at some point so it felt right. good for people to, to kind of seek us out for that and uh, cool. people like Lil Silas, who brought Jesse Powell through. Ah, yeah, yeah. We did some Can't records him. for him. Right. That was a, that was a great experience. But yes, yeah. nice, nice. nice. Okay. Um, the tour thing was great with Tony. You know, she was doing getting ready to do her secrets tour, and I would imagine, you know, she was like, "Shoot, when I started thinking about bands, who could be better than the condition to be my Boom. my band?" So. Yeah. That was kind of a great experience because it came at the time where I think we had just done definition of a band. And like I said, we had that sound on the record and then we, here we are opening up for her in Europe. Right. And the appreciation that we got as musicians yeah. and being a band yeah. in Europe was amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, it just reminded me because I always watch old documentaries of, you know, people like Miles and all that. Right. And I, I think about the appreciation that they got back in the day overseas and then they come back to America and it'd be like a whole different thing yeah, yeah a whole different thing you know yeah. Yeah. back to the the situation with this country and right all that so that was a great feeling and it was it was good timing for us too you right. know what I mean to be over in Europe and like when I tell you the critics that and and the interviews it was like like you guys are students of music and and the Minneapolis sound and everything and bands and all that, like to go over there and for them to have that same appreciation was wild. Cause <laughs> you know, we, yeah. you know, doing stuff in America, you wouldn't get, always get that same appreciation for it. You know, yeah. I, I, I think we're kind of fickle when it comes to that. That's the problem. That's the problem. We're fickle. And I think that's why my particular opinion, I think we have short, we have a long evolution of R and B. Mm -hmm. But it's so, it's so, a lot of times it's so, who's the next hot thing for the next yeah. couple months? And then who's the next hot thing after that? Yeah. Nothing stays, nothing stays really ingrained for a long time. And we just fickle yeah. like that. Japan is just like Europe. Yeah. They, they love the whole American band scene, the yeah, whole love American it. artist thing, but we don't appreciate it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. They love it over there. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, did that call you by surprise, Kerry, your European experience? Because, you know, I, I, as from this part of the world, I used to live, well, in the UK and used to traverse um, back and forth across Europe. And even down to, as Wayne mentioned back in the days, we used, to, we used to work in a record store and stuff. And down to the actual music itself, you would find, say, a mint condition album, just using it as an example, that would be released in the US. But when you go to Europe now, you'll find the same main condition album, or probably with two or three bonus tracks that you probably not even find in the US. Right, right. You know? yeah. It's just a totally different world over there. Yeah. Very no, I, I, I was definitely surprised by it. But at the same time, you know, it was at a point in our lives where I think we were just soaking it in. You know what I mean? It was like the first time that we just really traveling the world as a group and as a band and, and doing shows and being in different countries and cities every day and talking to people from those different countries it, it was amazing 
Uh, I don't know that I was surprised by the reaction, but I definitely appreciate it. So that, that brings me to this question in terms of the, the culture and the language barriers. Like, so if you go to Germany and Belgium and those countries, what was it like, like for them to express their likes for mint condition? You know, I wanted to know more about the music behind mint condition. Yeah, you know, uh, I don't think we had so much problem with the language barrier. A lot, a lot of the people, you know, like I said, the critics that interviewed us, you could tell that they were heavily into, you know, right. deep music, uh, musicianship type of stuff. So um, right. we didn't have too many issues with that. But it, like I said, it was it was really just good to to get that appreciation, you know, from over there. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think uh, who's up? Me? Yeah, go ahead. Doug. Go ahead, Doug. All right. I'm going to go ahead. And uh, we already talked about uh, the discovery of Mint. And um, I'll just go ahead and ask. Actually, I'll go ahead and ask my question. A number of us, including myself, have seen your 90s R&B alumni show on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. The well, issue that, that you I'll did... I believe the issue it was it was the episode that you did about Pretty Brown Eyes. You told a real short story about Oh Swing. You, you saw me swing. So yeah, sorry. Yep. That's it. Yep. You told a short story about um when you got to meet Stevie. Tell us that story real quick. Oh man. That was just an amazing night, you know. But to go in more detail, we were in LA. Uh, we were doing a show. I think we were doing a sound check and we get the call and they were like, Stevie Wonder, he heard, you know, you send me swing and he wants to meet the group that did it. So we did the show that night. It's like, cool, we out, let's go. <laughs> Went straight to the studio, walked in, sat down and he hadn't, he wasn't there yet. And, you know, we're sitting there chopping it up and he walks in and he's singing, you send me swinging. <laughs> and I was just like, it, it was another one of those moments where I was like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Yeah, you know, yeah. for me, like Stevie Wonder, he was probably, you know, that's probably the first album cover that I remember seeing on the front of my mom and dad's bed. Like I remember seeing it laying there and I picked it up and right. I was looking at it. I still look at that yeah. cover today and I'm like, the songs in the kid yeah. life is just amazing. Yeah. Amazing yeah. record. Yeah, and um uh, you know, to fast forward those many years later and be sitting in the studio with him, it was incredible. So, you know, after that, he came in and we talking and we sat around the piano and he's playing. And, you know, I think I mentioned it in the clip too, like just seeing his fingers hit the piano, like I, I've never seen anybody play the piano like that. And, and it wasn't what I expected either. It was like different. Right. I was like, you know wow. if you wonder so it was <laughs> nice. just an amazing experience it's a legend it that's amazing. a legend there man yeah beautiful yeah. Music. definitely definitely right so right. Paul, do you want me to ask one of your questions there um yeah go for it all right who came up with a name for the group and what's the significance of mint condition oh <laughs> You know it. I uh, I want to say that it was uh between Lawrence and Stoke. I, I'm not exactly sure, and it's um somebody had asked me a while back about that, and I meant to ask Stoke like who who came up with it because I, <laughs> I I had forgot or I didn't really know, and I really didn't get a chance to do that before this. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask him like. What, what is the meaning? But I, you know, I know in, in interviews and things in the past, we talked about it. It's really just kind of like being in top form as a musician, just being at your best. Um, I would say is the overall meaning of it behind it. But I, I can't tell you exactly came up with it. Okay. okay. But I'm gonna find out. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> Go ahead, Paul. Right. Hey, okay. Paul, you're up. No problem at all. No, you know, Kerry, the last week or so, we've been reflecting on, you know, the celebration of mm -hmm. Prince. Yeah. And because of that now, man, you know, that one, there, there's so many words to describe him. 
you know, he's a pioneer, he's so much. But yeah. my question to you is, did you have any interaction with Prince? And if so, what's the best advice that he gave to you? Wow, you know, it's really deep because uh, again, me growing up in South Minneapolis, um, that was kind of my, another close relation to him. He grew up in North Minneapolis. Outside of that, we both went to the same church, Park Avenue Methodist, which is where I got kind of exposed to some gospel because they had some incredible uh, Soul Liberation Festival every summer where all the right. dopest gospel groups from around the country would come through for like a whole okay. week. But anyways, when I got a chance to actually sit down and talk to him, that was one of the first things that we talked about just growing up in Minneapolis. And um, But aside from that, I, I met him. Um, you know, I had left the group and then Mint had actually started doing shows and touring with Prince. Yeah, I remember So that. he was, you know, he was really familiar with us and really familiar with the group. But one thing I really remember the most that stands out to me, I don't even think I told anybody this, but the first time that we had dinner with him here in Vegas when he uh, had started his residency and Tony was doing her residency at the Flamingo which is amazing. You got two black headliners on the strip yeah. in Vegas, headlining yeah. shows. Like, it was an amazing time. So we sat down, had dinner, and before we started, he was like, I just want to tell you that I prepared, you know, music for us to hear tonight that just consists of music that you did and music that you did, talking about me and Tony. And I was, like, blown away from that. Just, like, I've never, first, you know, as Prince, but yeah. I've just never met anybody that just had that kind of thoughtfulness and foresight of, you know what I mean? Just right. interacting with people and just, it just made the whole thing real special. And uh, he was an incredible guy. We had a lot of uh, other in interesting conversations, you know, about the industry. Boy, I'm sure. And his I'm approach sure. to the industry, which was, you know, kind of described it to me as very spiritual and very warlike like and when i look back now after he's gone I'm like yeah it was definitely spiritual to him and it was definitely war for him because he really fought yeah you know the record companies and things so yeah right. uh i don't know uh some of the other advice that he gave me I i'm gonna just kind of keep it personal because it, it was such a special thing and you know sure. what I mean just sure. having that opportunity to talk to him but those are uh, some understood. of the things that I remember right off the hand Appreciate right off hand that you know really meant a lot to me you know especially right. as somebody that I admired and I, I can't think of other than Stevie Wonder there's nobody that had a bigger impact on musically than Prince I bottom line know. period there's just nothing else to say about it gotcha. you know? I'm sure in his presence I mean just the mere fact that you are just, I mean, once again, it goes back again to the prior conversation we had with Jimmy and Terry. And of course, around that time was Prince. And I guess yep. you were listening to all the 1999 back in the day and everything. Yep. And that would be actually for him to give you advice. That must have been mind blowing for sure. Very mind blowing. Yeah, no question. No question. Very mind yeah. blowing. And, you know, what the other thing that was crazy is after he passed, hearing all the stories of other people that he had those same conversations with it just made me just like so appreciative that I was one of those people and it made me like you know now when I'm talking to younger musicians or younger people that want to get in the industry I will sit down and tell everybody anything they want to know from my point of view right. because I feel like that's what we owe right the next people right. coming up and I think like he went above and beyond doing that you know, when you hear the stories, not even just musicians. He, Prince has sat down with actors, comedians, Thank everything you, you could think of. Yeah, and, right. Exactly. Yeah, because me and people, we had this conversation, let me cross but me and people had this conversation the other day. It was yeah. not about musicians, but anyone in the entertainment industry, Prince yeah. was there for them. I remember watching a recent interview, um, interview with um, a music mogul, L.A. Reid, and yep. Prince called him to give him advice about then yep. about what he should do with RSA Records. And yep, you know, right. what happened, what, I'm sorry, La Face Records, my, my apologies, La Face Records. Yeah, of course, yep. they sold it into to, to Arista. And even up to this day, Ellie Reed said to him, that's one decision that he regretted doing. 
friends advise him, don't do it. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. You know, in hindsight, he said, well, that's one, of the, you know, looking back, that's, he should have kept it, you know? So, you know, Prince, he, as you said, he gave a lot of good advice to a lot of good people um, all over the entertainment industry. Yeah. And he, but not, not only did he give the good advice, but he also represented it too. Like, yeah. you know, this dude came out on stage with slave on his face and, and yes. changed his name and did everything. Right. Like that's, that's war with record yes. company. <laughs> you gotta exactly. do all that. Exactly. So, he, you know, he represented it everything that he was saying you know what i mean and he backed Great. it up for sure so do you think that the when prince went through that period when he changed his name you know to the symbol and whatnot who do you think understood him more was it the fans or was it the actual musicians themselves or the record label who do you think really understood that message when it first came out um i it's hard for me to say what the record label thought because, you know, from my point of view, they're just going back to dollars and cents again and just, you know, whatever is in the best interest of making money. But um, I think the fans rocked with them for a minute through it. Um, I think musicians, you know, saw the change he was taking. <clears throat> to me, I would say the only downside was you know, we like to see people just in a creative element. And I think when you're at war, with the record company. I don't know that you're in your most creative element. Who knows what his right. music would have sounded like had he not had those trials and tribulations with them and he just would have just been doing, mm -hmm. you know, not that he didn't do whatever he wanted to do, but that that was a major thing, I think, in his career. I think that affected the trajectory of his career and, and the music that he was doing, no doubt. Okay, no question, yeah. no question, yep. All right, who's up? Me? Yeah, you All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Paul's question for him. You talked a little earlier about your incredible time with Mint Condition and Jimmy and Terry at Flight Time. Personally, what have you learned from Jimmy and Terry as a songwriter and producer? Man, <laughs> that, that's a tough one because I, you know, it's hard to even just break it down in the songs. Like I, I've learned so much from those guys again. And it get, really just goes back to just, you know, growing up in South Minneapolis, seeing two black successful businessmen, you know what I mean? Running the company, right. making millions of dollars. Like that's not, that's, that's hard for people like us in our generation to come across that and yeah. see that and have that kind of inspiration. So I'm, Aside from music, I'm incredibly grateful just to have witnessed that, you know what I mean? Because that seeing those kind of images helped us, you know, be the next right. people to come along. And I'm sure that, you know, people seeing, uh, you know, five brothers graduate from St. Paul Central and go on to do music in, in a successful right. group like Man Condition, I'm sure that was influential for the people coming up and seeing that. Yeah. So that all aside um from a songwriting standpoint you know it it just doesn't get any better than terry and jimmy and they've they've touched different styles of music um again i go back to the 90s r&b and i i crack up because i'm like here's people that influenced the 90s the music they did in the 80s right. they did incredible music in the 90s and then still going today is like, sure. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there's not a lot of people that I can look back and say, yeah, they, they influenced, they did it. They're still doing it. You know what I mean? So right, right. Um, I, I learned a lot from them just in so many things, but I, it's, it's hard for me again to just sum it up to music and, you know I mean? Just like I said, like, you know, seeing their families and our families being close and, there's just so many levels that I admire those two brothers on, for sure. Cool. Yeah. Well, now that you have Jam and Lewis coming up with the Volume One collection, are you looking forward to it? Are you one of those hardcore oh fans god. that just waited? Oh my god. First of all, <laughs> that he don't know nothing. <laughs> like, oh. man. Yeah, man. That I mean, that was incredible because, you know, Faith, being uh another huge influence for me as a songwriter to see the three of them yeah. on one project Absolutely. was like 
how how did we even deserve this? How did we get this lucky <laughs> to see this? But uh, no, nah, it's incredible, and I I can't wait to see what's coming next with it. Cool. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask was for you as an artist, you know, obviously you could compose a lot of music, but what was it like when you heard your very first single on the airwaves? Man, I, oh, that was wild. I, and I think it's like, I, I would venture to say it's probably the similar situation for a lot of people because it's that first time you hear it on the radio and you're like, oh, okay, we've done something. We kind of made something here, you know what I mean? And right. it's just a, a pure excitement. And it's it's something that gives you that feeling like you accomplished something. Right. But um, yeah, and it, it was especially wild for us in Minnesota because at the time we had really one black radio station, KMOJ, which uh, was a smaller station. So you couldn't even hear it in certain parts of the city. You know what I mean? Like when me and my brothers were younger, we'd be hanging out the window with hangers and stuff attached to the stereo <laughs> trying to get the reception just so we could hear right. black music. You know what I mean? Growing right. up in Minnesota. Wow. But um, yeah, if by the time it? we heard it on the radio there, it, it was amazing feeling. What amazing. song was that? It was Pretty Brown Eyes. Pretty Brown Eyes, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a classic hit up to this day, yeah. Kerry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Doug. Appreciate that. All right. Um, actually, I'll go in and ask your question, Wayne. Sure. So we had Mint, Sounds of Blackness, but then after a while, Flight Time started bringing in not only solo artists like Alexander and Sherelle, but you had Low Key and you had oh, yeah. Solo. Was there any sort of friendly competition or were you guys staggered to the point where you know, Solo was busy doing their thing, getting notoriety. Mint did their thing, getting notoriety. And, and you know, you had Solo. How was, was that kind of, around that time? I would say it was more of the latter. Like, not too much competition, but it was just like a, a breeding ground for, you know, I remember going into the studio while Low Key was working on records and just watching, like, Prof T and Lance work and, and the way they were Ooh, stacking awesome. drums and doing stuff. Yeah, I was yeah. like... You know, it was, you know what I mean? Like we kind of fed off each other and just, you know, it was it was definitely a great environment. Not too much competition. However, I will say, in condition, we we were known as a band that if if there's a show with five groups on it and in conditions on the show, like you better be careful where you put you us in that show because <laughs> we, we really coming with it all the way on the show. Yeah. So we just had that reputation for doing shows. And then when Low Key came along, there was one particular show that we did where after that show, I was like, what just happened? Like, okay. these dudes were incredible. They yeah. had a horn section. Oh. They had joints. <laughs> they had, you know what I mean? It was just, it was that particular night. We we didn't do it. We didn't get an uh, opportunity to do a lot of shows together, but that right particular thing i think it was like a jam lewis event that we were doing and that we kind of laughed about it later like y'all really just really just whooped our ass with that <laughs> for real. Like, like just, you know what i mean and i'll be the first one to say like if that's what happened that's what happened right 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 you know what i mean but so like i say it wasn't really a competition thing but we were we were always trying to you know come with our best and, right you know um I mean, that kind of brings me to another quick question I didn't have on the list, but we all saw the interview with you and Jeff Taylor, and we interviewed Jeff as well. And, oh, right, right. You know, yeah. he has nothing but good things to say about Kerry, you know, the yeah. relationship yeah. that you guys That's developed guy, over that time. And yeah. that was, uh, that whole time was was really magical in the 90s and what it was, was happening at the flight time. And, uh, you know, I follow Jeff's credits as well, you know, because he did his thing at at flight time he told he many did. stories about when he was at flight time and it was just yeah. that whole era was just incredible man yeah incredible. yeah so many people that came through there you know crush back yeah. in the day yeah. they crush. were on the uh they were on the mo money soundtrack mo money soundtrack yeah. um 
man, just so many incredible people. Um, right. Bobby Ross Avila and the Avila yeah, brothers. Avila brothers, yeah. Man, <laughs> if I'd have to say, you know, some of the most rare and just uber talented, I, I would have to say Bobby Ross and his, his brother, man. Just wow, okay. incredible talent. All right. I've always you heard know, that to is, come to come through yeah. flight time, yeah. right? You know, I've you, you could ask pain. anybody, and they will say, "Yeah, those those brothers just blew our mind." Sweet. With okay. talent. So. All right. I, I always heard that their drum programming was just out this world. You wanted, oh. you know, something a trap laid with some hard beats. These yep. were the guys to go to. Yeah, incredibly you, talented, and you know, Bobby on the keyboards and right. talk box and everything. Yeah. And I think they're doing some great stuff now too. You know, oh yeah, some, yeah, some, some of the I current remember. records. So, right, incredibly talented. Right, right, definitely. Yeah. Harry, right. Paul, you up? Well, I am up. And um, the next question, actually, yeah, the next question, as Doug mentioned, Flight Hemp Studios brought in many artists. Now, for you, Kerry, mm -hmm. which of these artists stood out to you, and why? I know we put you on the spot right here, but <laughs> that's, you know, I, anyway, that's Wayne's question, by the way. <laughs> so blame him. I, when I think about flight time and the artists coming through there, you know, I almost kind of look at it as being Janet's house, really, because so much of her music was yep. created there and all that. And I feel like when she was there, there was another particular energy, too. Right. You know what I mean? It would be like, being at Paisley Park and Prince come in, you know what I mean? So um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that was a special thing. I know when they worked on the Michael project and when they did the song with both of them on there with Michael and Janet, the Scream song, that was a memorable time. Were you um, there for that? I was probably just around. We might have been one of the other studios working, but you know what I mean? When things like that is going on, you, you could just feel the energy. So, right, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. But, you know, Sweet. for all the people that came through there, like I said, you know, if, if I had to go with some of the most just crazy talent, I'm going to go back to the Avila brothers. You know what I mean? Like wow. they were okay. somebody that just came through that was really special. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. They, they probably should be given their own unsung episode because, I mean, they've done some tracks, man, that yeah. I mean, they are truly unsung. And they should definitely. be that, that definitely. props. Definitely. Yeah. So, Kerry, you, you host a show on your, your channel called the 90s R&B Alumni. What's yeah. that about? So, this you know, yours. I really, really, you know, over the years since then, you know, I, just having conversations with other musicians, producers, and just everyday fans of 90s R&B, it became evident at some point that this genre of music, these, you know, this decade, there was really something special about it. Right. And, you know, now I just call it like, you know, R&B's most cherished decade. I'm not saying that, you know, the music in the 90s was the best over the 70s or 80s. You know, music is right. music from here to eternity. But as far as that particular time, there was something special about it. And I, you know, being of that time, I'm like, you know, I want to put light on this. And I want to talk about it. And so what I do with the show is I really just kind of, you know, sometimes it feels weird to me because I'm really taking it from such a personal point of view. Yeah. right you know right, what i mean right. like and yeah. i'm definitely starting with my favorite songs you know what i mean like yeah, i'll yeah, reach yeah, out yeah, to yeah. the fans i'll be like right. you know, tell me tell me what you guys want to talk about but just know that we're gonna start with my favorites first <laughs> you know this is how it is but you gotta do that right right you know so it's it's been a lot of fun man and and like i said just rediscovering things and and i really try to take my time with the episodes and i really try to do, you know, a little bit of research and really come at it from a personal standpoint. A lot of times I talk about how it relates to men conditioning because, you know, we were out at that same time. Right. And it's it's been a lot of fun and people have really been enjoying it. So I'm looking forward to doing a lot more. And we're definitely uh, we, we to watched um, a few episodes uh, of your show and we love how you break it down, the elements right, of uh, the songs and what 
what the producers were, were getting their momentum or their influence from and mm -hmm. how it was brought forward to i guess the um the speed of the the sound you know mm -hmm. to, to like how, how do you take a nice sample of a slow jam or slow song and make it into a hardcore hip hop and stuff yep. so that there we really love how you really brought down some of those those songs I so appreciate we're it. really looking forward to more of those episodes Definitely. on your channel thank you so, thank sure. you i appreciate it so um as you can see when you want to watch carolos you can see it on the, the youtube 90s r b alumni and um carrie he has many many more episodes coming and um we want to thank carrie loose for coming on and joining the dynamic duo on thank the flight time interviews so thank, thank you again mr carrie lewis thank you i appreciate thank it you very thank you very much i really appreciate it yeah, yeah. I remember really you it. can like and subscribe to the flight time interviews here on youtube and to our many viewers on facebook thank you so much Thank you very Thank much, you. Dave. Right. Very much appreciated. And Thank on you. behalf of all of us, from Kerry, J4, Mr. Fresh, and myself, Figo, we're signing off. Base. Peace. All right.